Well, what we're going to do this afternoon is to be considering particularly Daniel chapter 2 and see how it's being fulfilling or being fulfilled right now throughout the world scene. So you may have some questions. There's plenty of material we're going to be looking at today. So afterwards, I'll come around and talk to you all if I get a chance. And so if you'd like to at that point to ask questions, that'd be really good. I'd be very thrilled if you did. But first of all, in Isaiah chapter 43, we won't turn it up, but it says that I am God and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So God is working the affairs of this earth at this time and is bringing to pass his purpose. Now I want to show you that first of all. Then I want to look at Daniel chapter 2. Now if you go back a few years, go back to September 11, 2001. And at that time, Bush was told America is under attack. And it certainly seemed that way from terrorism. Last year, the same took place almost. The same took place and he is alarmed. The Prime Minister of France... And what that Prime Minister was told by, well, he's watching a sports match, we're at war. November the 13th last year. And indeed it was. Terrorism. In six places across Europe, there's five of them shown there, simultaneously there were attacks launched by the ISIS group into Europe. Terrorist attacks. 130 were killed. 350 wounded. But it hasn't stopped there. Look at this. Only a month or two ago, bombings in Brussels, the new normal. New normal. Europe has suffered another series of murderous attacks by jihadists. They will not be the last. And here we can see The Economist, a leading newspaper on that. They see this as a very serious consequence. At that time, 30 dead grew beyond that. 200 injured. And so it grew. But in this occasion, it was exceedingly frightening because very shortly afterwards, they intercepted one of the men that escaped. Now, you notice it on the television, on the videos, of one of the fellas getting off the scene who didn't get killed in the terrorist activity. And they tracked him down. And by the time they tracked him down, he shot somebody dead. The man was a security guard for this facilities. He'd taken his card that allowed them to get into the nuclear facilities. Why would he want that? What they are fearful about is a nuclear terrorism. What they call a dirty bomb. Where they get hold of nuclear material, put explosives in it and just blow the dust everywhere. Do that in Hamilton large amount of dust scattering right across the area of Hamilton. You won't be able to inhabit inhabit Hamilton for 20 years till that dust breaks down, the radioactivity breaks down. They are terrified of what's going on, utterly terrified. Here's a sign of that. Unused school buses. Where? Los Angeles. Just a single fake email was sent to the, to the Education Department of Los Angeles and the result was, only a little while ago, December this year, a 1,000 schools closed, 640,000 students couldn't go to school that day. Oh, but it's only happened there, wouldn't it? Well, no, even in Australia where we come from. Look at this. Same happened in Australia. February the 1st, on two days... Emails, fake emails were sent and they had to close schools. Get students out of the school, out on the grounds in case it was blown up. Terrifying. And yet we should expect that and know that. The Lord Jesus Christ, speaking under inspiration from God, said this at the end. Men's hearts failing them for fear and looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Remember what Isaiah 43 says? God will tell the future. And there we are. He was saying that. Speaking on God's behalf. 
And he said that was a precursor to this. And when those things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Can you ever remember anything like what we're seeing now? With men's hearts failing them for fear? And what does that tell us? It's beginning. My goodness, it seems to more than begun. How long have we got to wait before our redemption draws nigh? Christ's return. Time is very short. But now, further to that, in the book of Daniel, we won't turn to it, but in Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar t- was told that God controls the world affairs. Right? What he was told is that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth to whomsoever he will, and particularly the lowest of men, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, the humblest of men. So he was telling us that ultimately the Lord Jesus Christ will return from heaven and establish his kingdom upon this earth. God rules. He will bring to pass his purpose. It's sure. It's certain. There's no doubt about it. Just like we said before, Christ said there would be increase of terrorism, fear, and that would lead up to Christ's return. It's certainly happening. Similarly in this way, we're going to see that what God says does happen. And we're going to look at one of the most major prophecies in the word of God, Daniel chapter 2. Now most of you have still got it open before you. I want to lay a foundation for that in a moment in regard to that. But today, tonight, this afternoon we're predominantly going to use those three quotes. We could have used heaps more. Time doesn't permit. There's plenty we could look at. But Daniel 2 describes Daniel's image. There it is. Head of gold, feet of iron and clay. All right? Symbolising these empires down through time. Now, most of the churches down through time have seen this as being historic. It's almost as if the image should have been laying down because after that came that. After that came that. These were the empires of the world. But we in Christadelphia many years ago, in the days of one of our writers, Dr John Thomas, said, no, that's got to be standing up at the last day. Now, look with me to Daniel for a moment, Daniel chapter 2. And let's first of all look at verse 28. And if you've got a pencil, it's worth colouring this in. Very, very worthwhile, because it really gives to us the clue to what this book's all about, or this image is all about. Look at verse 28. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets, and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. That's what's worth colouring in. So you see, that whole image relates to the latter days. Again, let's look at verse 35. Then the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together. Together. There's the key word. So you can see it's got to be smashed at one time. Again, verse 44. Look at this. And in the days of these kings, that's all the kings he's been describing, from the gold down, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And that kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. So here we are. It's got to destroy all of those kingdoms. Well, how could it be? Unless it's standing up, It's existing at the same time. Well, how's that going to be achieved? Well, it's because these territories, not the empire so much, the territories must be united together. There's a bit of a description of some of the territories that we're going to look at, representing each of those areas. The Babylonian Empire was in the area of Syria and Iraq. The Medo-Persian Empire included that area, plus also Iran, Afghanistan and Pakistan to the borders of India. Greece did the same. And as well as that, Greece and Turkey, obviously. And then the Roman Empire, East and West and Roman Europe. All right? 
And then finally, the ten toes. Well, we'll come to that in a minute. All right? So, let's go back to our image. There's the image. What nation heads this confederacy? Well, we're not told in Daniel 2. We've got to go outside of Daniel chapter 2. But it shows to us that we're Russia. Russia. How do we know that? Well, Daniel 11 says this. We won't turn it up. We really haven't got a terrific lot of spare time. And there's plenty to be looking at today. The king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries, and listen to this, he shall enter also into the glorious land, that's Israel. So a power from the north, called the king of the north, will invade finally Israel. Now the same is found in Daniel 11, Ezekiel 38. This is worth turning up. And again, if you've got your pencils there, it's worth colouring in. Look at Ezekiel 38. And let's pick up with verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people Israel dwell safely or confidently, shalt thou not know it. That's the state we see now. And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, Thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses and a great company and a mighty army. Just like Daniel 11 verse 40. The king of the north invades Israel, the glorious land. Here it is, and I'm going to use the RSV for a minute, because it picks up the fact that the word the, the, out of the north parts is very strongly stated. It says, come from your place out of the uttermost parts of the north. You and many people with you. Now, think where Ezekiel wa was when he early in the peace wrote those prophecies. Probably thinking about Israel. Go to the north. Go to the uttermost parts of the north. How far north can you go? Some of the young people. What's the extreme north? Very hard. The North Pole. Okay. Go anywhere south, uh, anywhere from that, you're going south. So just south of the North Pole. There it is, Russia. No doubt about it. Very clearly stated, isn't it? Now, we're in Ezekiel 38. Come with me, look at verse 2. Here's the leader. Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now, first of all, he's called Gog, and he's the chief prince. Here's our Russian power. The word Gog means... According to the Companion Bible, all that is powerful, gigantic and proud. And there's a picture of Putin on the front page of the Time magazine a couple of years ago. Very proud. Again, he's called the Prince, an exalted one. And that's the way he sees himself. Here he is in a bit more modern picture of him. Not much different, still very arrogant, very proud. It may be another man, but it looks very likely to be the case that this is him. This is him. But now, in verse 3 and 4, it goes on to say, and I'll turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws. Are you talking about go, Russia? And I will bring thee forth and all thine army. So between where we Gog is described and the invasion of, the, of Israel, this has got to happen. I believe it's already happened. I'm going to use Brother Thomas, Dr. Thomas, who wrote way back there in 1948, thereabouts. And in Orphus Israel, he says this. He said, let Russia's treasury be as empty as it is said to be. It will only oper operate as a pressure from within, causing the autocrat, that's the leader, the Gog, to enter into the countries and to overflow and to enrich himself with spoil. What's going to be the hook to go in his jaws? to enrich himself with spoil. Now, look at the situation in Russia at the moment. If you went back two and a half years ago, The Economist magazine said Russia got 73%, nearly three quarters of its money, from oil and natural gas. All right? But what's happened since then? Look, The Economist. The Russian Economist 
are now debating how long before their economy faces collapse. That's what Dr Thomas said. And he said he will invade to fill his coffers. Most think it can only totter on for two years or so, but there is a real chance things could get a lot worse a lot sooner. And so here's the price of oil, and it's been going down. It's not looking too good. Now let's go back in history a little, and let's follow through what's happened to Russia. Here we are, close of the Second World War. After the Second World War, it had invaded and formed these communist countries, which we call those countries behind the Iron Curtain, the Warsaw Pact countries. Then in 1939 through to 1989, toward the end there, the oil price collapsed, can you believe it, to $12 a barrel. Iran and Iraq were trying to pump so much oil to fund their war over the latter part of the, close to this period here. And the price of oil finally reached $12 a barrel, but it hurt Russia. If you go on the web, you'll see pictures, the queues of people lining up to just get a loaf of bread. They were desperate for food, absolutely desperate. And in the desperation, what was Russia going to do? What did Russia do? Well, I'll tell you what it did. It pulled itself out of these countries. It said, we can't afford to keep our soldiers there. We've got to get them out. So they brought them home and put them into industry. And let those countries to become independent. So here it is. That's how it has been since 1991. And those countries since then thought, well, we're never ever going to have to worry about Russia again. And so... As the scripture says, by peace he shall destroy many. And the bulk of the European countries have not armed. Oh, they've maintained an army, but it's back. It's really run down. Hopeless. Yeah, just a couple of months ago, so, uh, Sweden had six submarines come into its waters. And they sent the very best ship out to see if what it was, what these submarines were, and what nation they came from. And they couldn't tell. So they contacted Britain, and Britain flew over a special aircraft that could detect these things. Yeah, that one's Russian, that one's Russian, that, they're all Russian. Sweden just hadn't upgraded, like almost all of Europe. And so, now here's where we see things now. Russia has begun to move. Ukraine found massive quantities of oil, shale oil, and very clearly, within a few years, they would be able to supply the whole of Europe. And so Russia determined it had to move. It had to move. And so it moved into Ukraine. It took Crimea, 2014. It hasn't stopped there. What's it doing now? Moving to Syria. You see, Russia has armed and moved against Ukraine. And then into the Middle East. Clearly she's planning to do that, or has been planning to do that. Go back one year from now, or a little bit more, a year and a bit, just about the time of Easter. A show of strength. Putin uses VE Day to stage the biggest Red Square military parade since the collapse of communism. There it is. Never seen anything like it. Latest, the best, the greatest, heaps of weaponry in Moscow and various other cities. And the Europeans analysing it said this, Moscow is actively preparing for war in Europe, Daily Mail. But he didn't move into Europe. He caught them off hand. But what he did was, on that occasion, very shortly afterwards, he called up a huge number of troops 95,000 and put them on the borders of Europe. Easter last year. But he didn't stop there. That was that. He had already in March pulled in 80,000 and then in September 95,000 and then in October 150,000. This is beside his normal standing army. <coughs> beside his normal standing army. Something like 230,000 extra troops. What's it all for? Well, Ezekiel 38 says, first of all, 
He'll be a guard to his allies in the Middle East. And so Russia moved in, supposedly to help Assad, his ally. They moved down into the Middle East. Other problems were going on down there, and I just think it's fascinating that Dr John Thomas understood a little of this, or seemed to understand it. He said this way back in 1856, the Shiites of Persia and the Sunni hate each other with a hatred not exceeded by that which the Orangemen, that's the Irish Protestants, and the Romanists, the Roman Catholic Irish, hate each other. You see, they began terrorism. They started blowing each other up. Brother Thomas seemed to understand them, that that would be what the Arabs would do. They'd follow the same approach. And so, she, Persia, will, lead, uh, will be led to indulge in dreams of extending her frontier into, into the direction of Baghdad by the aid of Russia. The area of Iraq was getting weaker and weaker because they were fighting against each other. You listen to the radio sometime of how many people die each week in Baghdad alone. It's often thousands in terrorist activity. Terrible what's going on. And Iran therefore said, ha, an opportunity to get control of, ba of, of, of Iraq. But they needed help. And they got it. They asked for Russia to send in weaponry and down it came. And so things are moving. In came Russia into the Middle East to help Assad and to help the Iranians. Vladimir Putin begins a major, uh, bids for major world role as the forces move into Syria. Look at the date, September last year. Russia's military expansion into Syria, the largest employment, uh, deployment of Russian forces since the collapse of USSR. Massive numbers moving in. Here's Syria. In they came. They flew the planes in over Iraq and Iran. We'll talk more about that in a minute. They brought their ships into Tartus here. And so they were controlling this coastline here of Syria. Then they began flying in men in huge numbers. Not this way. Europe refused to let them pass. Turkey refused to let them pass. More on that in a minute. And so they came in, flying across these countries here. They were allowed to fly over the Iran and Iraq. And so here we can see, as the papers are saying, Telegraph in London, September. Putin is carrying out Russia's biggest military intervention outside of the old Soviet Union for almost 30 years. It's really stretching its muscles. It's moving. And there, in the Middle East, it began to support its allies, bombing and attacking city after city. But isn't America there? Yes, America had troops there. The papers pitched, the, captured the idea of what was going to happen or what was happening. Yeah, we are. There's Mr. Putin. There's Russia. <coughs> Do you know anybody know what this fellow here with this puppy, uh, this teddy bear is? It was Obama. That's how they saw it. She's not doing anything. And exactly true. She started to back out. It was getting so dangerous. And so the cities began to be hammered in support of those who are allies of Mr. Putin. Aleppo, sold by the Syrian army, backed by heavy Russian air power. In she came and bombed it. Look at the city. Would you like to be living there? And the result. Let's come back to the em em empires. So this has got to be an alliance of empires in the last day. Let's start with there. The Babylonian Empire, what's the territory today? Iraq, Syria. Okay, we'll put the next one to it to save a little bit of time. What's the next empire? There it is. The Medo-Persian Empire. All the way to the Indus, India. So we've got to see those countries allied together with Russia. With Russia. Ezekiel 38 says the same. All of them handling sword. And in those days, the word Persia, if you look up the meaning in the King James time, it did cover these countries here. 
All right? So what are we seeing? Who's the allies of Mr. Putin and Russia? Oh, Iraq, Iran, Syria. Iraq cooperating with Russia. Iran, Syria, on security issues. We're buddies. Mr. Putin goes down and visits the Iranians. There he is, the leader of Iran. There's Mr. Putin. What are they doing? Signing the biggest military deal ever with I Iran. We'll help you, all right? Big time. The best and the most important deal in the whole history of the Islamic Republic, said the BBC. So yes, they're allies with Syria, Iraq, Iran. What about Afghanistan? Oh yeah, well, America's just pulled out because, well, we brought some sort of semblance of stability into that area. That's what they thought. Australia pulled out too. So what does Afghanistan? Turns to Russia. Why? Because America is untrustworthy. What? Well, you see, America might, didn't really want to go to war again, and so you couldn't rely on them to be there to help. So right now, sadly, Putin is a better bet for the Afghanistanis, the Americans, than the Americans. So they're moving in, big time. So Afghanistan and, Pac and Russia sign a deal for weaponry. They're coming together. They're allies. Let's go to the next country. Let's go to the area of Pakistan, a little bit more dated, but in comes the leader, of the, mi the military leader from Russia and signs deals to supply Pakistan with weaponry. So think of it. Allies of Russia, from Syria to the borders of India, borders of India, the Indus River. But now, the Russian Middle East and allies are threatening Israel. You see, they are now putting troops from their countries into Syria. Putin signs the decree drafting another 150,000 conscripts into the Russian army. We referred to that before. As Iran, Hezbollah, they are up in the Lebanese area, a major ground offensive in Syria. So they're working together. Terrorists, Hezbollah, and Iran are working together in Syria. Hundreds of Iranian troops have arrived, backed by the Hezbollah and rebel fighters from Iraq and Afghanistan in Syria, supported by aircraft from Russia. But Russia didn't stop there. They brought in some of her top missiles. They placed them here. They could hit almost all of Turkey and most of Israel. They said, we're controlling the skies. We're controlling the skies. And the result, Israel extremely nervous over Russian operations in the Golan border. Debka, an Israeli paper. So, heavy battles raging from a point just south of Quenetra. Here's Quenetra, there's the Golan Heights. And so there, on the border of Israel, fighting is taking place. And the consequence of that fighting is just a few people on the move. Here's a little bit of an idea. We'll look at those that went down into Jordan. This is where they're being put up. There's only one of the camps. That's kilometres across of tents and such like. Imagine being going there. Staggering, isn't it? But now let's come back to the image. We've got to see the Grecian component established here. What does that mean? Well, yes, what we talked about before, now allied with Turkey and Greece. That's got to be united. And so, we've got to see the king of the north come against him, Turkey, like a whirlwind. So, Russia must conquer Turkey and ally itself with Eastern Europe. You know, if you go back in history, in 1453... Uh, the Christians in Istanbul or Constantinople were kicked out by the Muslims. And up in Moscow and St. Petersburg, they set up churches because they fled, fled north. 
And this is what you find on the top of their churches. You probably find around Hamilton churches with a cross on the top. They don't have a cross on the top exactly. They have a cross over the top of a moon. What's the crazy idea of having a moon there? There's another one. Another one. What they're saying is, we in Russia, us Russian Christians, are going to dominate over the moon again. We lost Constantinople in 1453, but we will retake it. That's the determined decision of the Russians. The Christian part of Russia wants that back again. But you see, Turkey's told Russia just to back off. Right? When Russia moved into Crimea up here, there was a group of people called the Tatars. They are Turkish ethnic Turks up in the area of Crimea. And traditionally, the Russians have been quite cruel to them. And so Mr. Ergen and their president of Turkey said, don't you touch our Tatars. You be kind to them. If you're nasty to them, Mr. Putin, we'll close this waterway, the Bosporus, to you. And you won't be able to get your ships out into the Mediterranean. When I read that article, I put that part up there. I didn't put the rest. I didn't have enough space. But what I went on to say, the newspaper said, we're amazed that this fella is crazy enough to talk that way to Mr Putin. You just don't talk like that. But he did. He said, you do that, we'll do this. But it hasn't stopped there. Mr Putin asked to fly equipment into Syria at the first over Turkey. And here's the response. Putin warns Turkey. Nice, friendly face. Okay? If necessary, we can stage a swift military coup d'etat against you. We can destroy you. I will defeat you. Shortly after those aircraft came in. And then, of course, Turkey did a silly move. Russian warplanes down by Turkish jets. They flew over only a little tiny bit of Turkey. And the Turks allowed them to be shot down, <coughs> destroyed. Putin was not amused. Putin called it, called it a crime, saying it would have serious consequences. Now, remember what we said? Russia must take Turkey. Mustn't. Part of the Russian, uh, the Gogian Confederacy, part of Daniel chapter 2. But you see, we need to be a bit cautious there, because Brother Thomas, again, writing long ago, said this. Yes, he said they will take Turkey. But we, talking about us, brethren and sisters, have not to wait the advance of the Russian Gog against Constantinople. What's he saying? He says, it's my opinion, he wasn't dogmatic in this regard, but he says, it's my opinion that Turkey will fall after Christ has returned. Now you look, a bit, look at it. Turkey's a real problem to Russia at the moment, but Russia seems to be avoiding tackling it at this stage. And I'm sure that when they're ready and good and well, they will take it. Okay? But meanwhile, things are working for Russia that they want to exploit. Here it is. They're bombing Syria. Been in there, sometimes smashing hospitals and such like. The people are fleeing in droves. Look at it. You'd want to be breathing in same t in opposite times on either side of the ship where you might push somebody over. It's so packed. They're coming in in droves into Europe. Okay? When this was written September last year, half a million had come in. And now they were saying, they're coming sweeping in here and here's where they're gone. The height of the red line shows you how many there are. And there's Germany. But they were coming in at the rate of 4,000 a day. They're going to be fed, they're going to be housed. They're going to, yeah, the Europe's going to be struggling under that effect. The crisis has overwhelmed the European leaders, said the BBC. Staggering scene. And they're extremely terrified about what's going on. Here's another ship coming in. Have a look. Sorry. There they are queuing up to get on board the boat. A few got on board the boat and got pushed off the other side. There they're in the water. Everybody's desperate to get out of Turkey into Europe. Now, not every scene is like that. 
I think that was quite dramatic. But look at the article. BBC, Supreme Commander of NATO, says they are weaponising migrants. That means they're arming them. Russia is arming them to destabilise and undermine the continent. He also suggests that criminals and extremists and fighters were hiding in the flow of the migrants. And so Europe suddenly, after the two terrorist attacks, or the first one that I put up, are, is acting. They don't want them now. So look, they're thrown up along the borders of Macedonia. There's somebody walking between the barriers. They put that right along the borders of Macedonia, as rapidly as they could. Same here, Serbia, Bulgaria, Ukraine, right across Europe, place after place. They're putting up barriers, and that's an early map. Late last year, uh, uh, late last year that was written down. More have gone up since then. And the idea of Europe being open zone is now breaking up. You used to be able to go to Europe and just zap your passport once and you can go anywhere in Europe. Not now, they say. Because they want to stop the Arabs moving here to here to here. And if they only, you know, they come to a border between one country and another and just walk across, then it's so easy. And they're saying Europe's now beginning to break up. More on that in a second. Come back to our image. Our image says it will separate into two legs and the result of that will be that this two will be united together in the image. So Europe must divide into two legs. And Greece and Eastern Europe must join with Russia. Remember the head is Russia. So Europe and Greece must, or well, Eastern Europe at this stage, we'll talk about Western Europe in a minute, will unite. So here we are, here's Greece. How the migrant crisis could accelerate her leaving the EU. Greece exit is Greece's exit from the EU. All right? The terrorist attacks in Paris have led to a hardening of attitudes across the continent. Country after country is saying, no more, no more. So they're building up in Greece. And Greece is having a real struggle to fund it. Greece stands to get really badly hurt. Now you may remember a little while ago, last year, Greece got assistance from Germany because of her financial state. So here's the picture depicting it. So here's Mrs Merkel, the leader of Germany, the richest country in Europe at that stage. I might add, not anymore, but that stage, there you are, representing the EU. She funded Greece's economy. Here's the Prime Minister looking on. <laughs> Things weren't going terribly well. So, Greek debt crisis endgame. ECB, that's the big European bank, agrees to pump more money into the Greece bank. Look at the rest of the article. As Russia enters the ring. Ah, oh. you see here is Mr Putin meeting the Prime Minister of Greece. A little cartoon added to show what's going on. Here's Mrs Greece trying to clean up the mess, I think. <laughs> there she is in her home and suddenly the door's open. Who's this? I labelled him so in case you couldn't recognise him. I thought you would, but, you know, there we are. Mr Putin at the door. Russia has said it, will willing, it is willing to consider giving financial help to Athens. Will this help you, Greece? Join us. All right? So here we see the image coming together. Click, click, click. All starting to fit. And the rest of Eastern Europe. Well, world has started spending more on weapons. No doubt about it. Look what's happening in these countries in the last few months. Spending 10%. 1.2, 16, 21, and so on. They're terrified. And we'll talk more about that on Wednesday night. Here we're just sticking to Daniel 2. We'll get in a little bit more depth on that on that occasion. All right. So NATO allies preparing to put four battalions on the eastern border. We've got to defend ourselves from Europe, from Russia. Romania 
only a few days ago got weapon missiles from America. Russia said, right, you're provoking us and have been moving this week more troops against the borders of Romania. They've got an excuse, they said. So here's how the world sees it. Russia. And NATO, <laughs> putting up a sign, <laughs> please stay away, please stay away. And here's, Mr. here's the people of the Baltic states and that area, <laughs> hoping the sign might work. Well, see, the scene is that NATO has brought up against the borders of these countries 4,000 NATO troops in the last month. And Russia has approximately that number extras on the border. The leader of Estonia asked Russia, America for help. America said, I oh, will get troops into your country in 48 hours. He said, they've got 32,000 troops on our border and it'll be all over in four hours. Four hours. They can have our capital city in four hours. More on that on Wednesday night. So, Russia has now got to control also the Western European area. In order for the Western leg to be formed. Now here is number two in the EU, Mr Juncker, second to top man. We can't let the EU relations with Russia be dictated by the US. That's what he says. What does he mean? What's going on here? Relations with Russia. Europe must improve its relationship with Russia. Why? Because he's terrified of Russia. He's bothered by what Russia's doing. He says, look, I can't get enough help from America, so we better try and get good with Mr Putin over here. And so here's another one. France is alarmed. After the terrorist attack in France, the French came to him and said, can you clean up these ISIS who caused the terrorism in France? And if you do, we'll fight with you. We'll support you. France is alarmed. France offers full support to Russia. Full support to Russia. We'll be allies with you in the Middle East on this. And you see, that's exactly what happened for a little while. And it may still be doing so. Here's a French aircraft carrier passing Gibraltar on the way to the Middle East. Here's the aircraft being taken off to support the Russian forces in Syria against the ISIS. Here's the planes being refuelled and such like. But they weren't the only ones. France was terrified and Germany was too. German tornado jets to help the French against the ISIS in Syria. And in so doing, help the Russians fighting together. So they're not firmly allied as yet, but the moves are there. Now, let's move on a little further. We're going to look at the feet. What about the feet? Well, it's got to be ten toes as in the feet of the image. All right? <coughs> Excuse me a second. And so, what do we expect to see happening? We expect to see Europe break up. Here is the leader of Luxembourg. The EU could break up within months. Within months. It, the collapse of the EU is just around the corner, he's saying. Things are really looking bad. We've only got a few months to get things sorted out or it will break up. And so they go on. Here again is our man, number two in the EU, Mr Juncker. The Europe at risk. If the Schengen, that's the open border plan, collapses, he said the European single currency, the euro, will be, be at risk if the Schengen passport free travel zone unravels. Things are looking difficult. The, country, the area is all breaking up. They've got different attitude to the Arabs, different attitude to what's going on. Here's Mrs. Merkel. Europe is on the brink of financial meltdown as German faces an economic ruin. Incidentally, who does Germany trade with more than anybody else? Russia. 
Russia. And Russia and her are boycotting each other at the moment. Guess what's happened to her economy? It's gone into deficit. Last quarter, it wound up 2.3 billion euro deficit. Used to boom. I guess VW didn't help either. But still, there we are. Um, anyhow, her economy is going down. Europe is a bit of a mess. Well, let's see what's going to happen. Let's come back to Brother Thomas. He didn't have newspapers to tell him what was going on. He had the Bible. And he said, no, Europe got invaded many years ago. The wild, semi-barbarous hordes will overspread the countries of the old Iron Kingdom. But the new inundation of barbarians will not be like it was in the times past. Then they lost their distinctive individuality, but not now. Now, it will break up into ten. See, this is what happened in times past. Into Europe, in the years 8400 to 500, approximately, in came the barbarians, the Huns, the Vandals, the Visigoths, the Burgundians, what we broadly called the barbarians, ten. And broke Europe up into its constituent parts, didn't it? But now we're getting more barbarian types coming in. Arabs from Syria, the Middle East, causing all sorts of strife. And important newspapers, a financial advising, or an, a newspaper that gives advice to business people, Stratfor, you may have heard of it. You can buy it, you know, and get it regularly sent to you, has this to say, March the 1st. How long ago is that? The shape of Europe of things to come. The Europe of things to come. And it speaks of seven particular different attitudes. But then it gives different colours slightly for areas that have got a similar attitude. Alright? Now Europe, we won't I'll skip this one. Time's not with me. But if you go through that area, which is the part of the territory of the Holy, old Holy Roman Empire, not Holy Roman Empire, Roman Empire, that area there, and put a number on each of the countries, you've got about ten. Ten. And they're saying it's going to break up into that sort of situation. That's their expectation. March the 1st. Staggering, isn't it? And they say the thing that will really escalate it is economics. Germany used to be good, but it's gone negative. France used to be good, but it's gone not so good. A lot of Jews are leaving and going to Israel, and they're pretty good at business, and the economy is starting to fall apart. The only economy that's left that's any good in Europe is Britain's. Boost for the Bradex hopes as Leave campaigns opens up with a huge lead on the EU referendum battle. In June the 23rd, Mr Cameron is going to get the nation to vote whether they stay in the EU or not. It's starting to look like they will leave. The UK minister warns of a domino effect in Brit if Britain leaves. The unravelling of the European project. Why do people think that Putin's so keen? I know why. He'd like to see Europe break up too. He's keen as mustard. <laughs> Lastly, Putin, the papacy, will bring all under her religious control and support Russian invasion of Israel. Now, if you've got Ezekiel 38 open, there's a key word in Ezekiel 38. It's the Hebrew word, kahal, rendered company. There's the verb from which it comes. It's worth colouring in if you can. I'm afraid I might not give you much time and I'll put it back up in a minute afterwards if you like. So don't worry too much, but... It's a Hebrew word, kahal, which the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, uses usually that word, which we, you know, it's translated often church. All right? So there is a religious base, along with the Russian base, to unite the nations in the Middle East. Uh, but Muslim? Christian? You're joking. Well, let's see. Go back a little bit. There's Putin with the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church. When Putin came to power, all the churches were closed down. 
but he's religious. So he's opened 25,000 churches. One stage, three churches were being opened every day across Russia. Very religious. And then he's down to see the Pope. Okay, it's a while back, but they're good friends. Good friends. State visit to Italy. And there we are, Catholic and Russian Orthodox churches are talking, <coughs> talking. And then he's been over to Istanbul, where the Eastern Orthodox Church head is. There is he meeting with him. Pope tells Bartholomew I that the necessary conditions for a restoration of unity between Catholics and Orthodox uh, Christianity is there. We should be one. He hasn't stopped there. The Pope asked the Protestants to join up. He said, I'm very sorry, we really were very cruel to you during the Inquisition. Many of you were murdered, but just forgive us and we'd like you to be under my control. All right? So Protestants hasn't stopped there. Is the idea that the Muslim worship the one true God just the Pope's opinion? Oh. So he's saying to the Muslims, come under my umbrella. In fact, three countries in the world were fighting because of Christianity against Muslim late last year. And they were in the area of Africa. And he flew down and saw all of those three countries and landed, went through the fighting lines and saw both sides and said, we are brothers, we should be at peace. He could have also said, I'm the mother of all the harlots and you should be part of it too. In fact, on one occasion, one of those countries, when he came in to fly in, the airport was gummed up with vehicles that looked like they could fly uh, to, due to fly, fighting. And he said to the pilot, he said, look, if you can't land, he said, I'm going to parachute in. They landed. But he was determined to get in there to see if he could reconcile Christian and Russian, uh, Christian and Muslim together. So now... Drawing this all to a conclusion, let's come back to our image. There it is. And you can see, although not everything is yet in place totally, it's on the way, isn't it? Rapidly moving. So we're expecting that to be the alliance that will form eventually. From the Indus right through to this area here. Britain will be out of it, of course, but more on that on Wednesday night. And so we're expecting from Ezekiel 38 that. Both chapters agree. That alliance must be established under Russian control. And then the Middle East will be invaded. And when it's invaded there in Jerusalem will be established the image. Russia will come down with all those allies and they will be in that particular territory. But remember, Daniel chapter 2 verse 44 and 40, uh, uh, states to us, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. And the stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon its feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Christ will invo become involved. God will send his son. And so there's the image standing and represented by that stone, Christ will come. And he will destroy that image. Break it to pieces. And he will establish his headquarters in Jerusalem. Zechariah 14 verse 4 says, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. We know that. That's what we saw. Those arrows coming in. The colours all around the area of the Middle East. They will involve themselves at Jerusalem. But then Christ will return. His feet will stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount will cleave in the midst thereof. And the result will be God's kingdom will be established on this earth. And we, all of us here, have the opportunity of having a part of that. It's thrilling. It's wonderful. But you see, the answer is very clear. If we want to be part of it, we've got to believe the truth. And we've got to do what Christ said just before he ascended. He was his final words almost. And he said, go into all the world and, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved. 
and he that believeth not shall be condemned. It's pretty straightforward. Three key steps. We've got to believe the gospel. A part of that gospel is the establishment of God's kingdom upon this earth. We've got to believe that good news. And then, having done so, be baptised. Having done so, having believed that, the truth, then on that basis be baptised. And then finally, continue faithfully until Christ returns. Well, you can see, ladies and gentlemen, as you look back over what we've looked at tonight or today, things are moving rapidly. How long have we got? We don't know, but it isn't long. Things are moving very, very swiftly. And now is the time, therefore, to be prepared, to be baptised if necessary, or to continue to walk faithfully until he comes. We'll leave it there, and I'll try afterwards to come around and have a chat to us, all of you, if you can. If you've got some real hard questions, that'd be great. I'll try and answer them. Thank you.